My name's uh, Paul Wellings and I'm the uh, chair for this session on the future of international student mobility and it is a great pleasure to, uh, to be here at this THE World Academic Summit. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, David Harrington who's closest to me, who's the managing director of uh, APAC Hobsons and based here in Melbourne, uh, Karen Kemka, who's partner and co-head of education practice at Parthenon and think based in Singapore, uh, and Jiro Kokuro, vice president of international affairs at, at Keio University in Japan. So uh, an interesting uh, international uh, panel and uh, a chance, I think, to reflect on the importance of, of, student, uh, of student mobility. Um, we're each going to, uh, to speak uh, briefly. Uh, I've got some slides, I know Karen's got some slides, and others will speak from, uh, from the table. And then hopefully there's a little bit of time left over uh, uh, at the end of the session before we go back. And for those of you who want to go and see uh, Ed Burns talk, which I think is the final talk of the day. So without further ado, um, future of uh, student, student mobility. So what I, what I wanted to do was to... Um, was to touch on sort of three, three issues. The way that uh, government policy has some influence on ideas about, about student mobility, specifically to focus on some details of uh, exchange versus sort of study abroad programs and to say a little bit about uh, what are the consequences of driving inward mobility or outward mobility uh, from, from economies. I'm not going to spend personally a lot of time talking about translational education and the, the, the big movements of students coming to do their full degrees, but rather to focus on, on particular programs. So on, 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 on the government uh, policy, um, just to pick two, uh, two economies that certainly I, I know well, but uh, uh, really a, a sharp sort of counterpoint about how you can um, change the mood music in economies through, uh, through through, go through government signals. I think here in, in Australia, uh, many of you will know that the, the current government has, has invested heavily in what's called the new uh, Colombo Plan, that's specifically a mobility program to allow uh, Australian undergraduates to engage into a set of countries that essentially run from Pakistan round into our sphere of influence in, in, uh, in, in the Pacific. And uh, that's had, as I'll show you shortly, a very large effect. I think we're we all live in a world of relatively encouraging state and uh, federal uh, policy. So I'm based in New South Wales, and you know, study New South Wales uh, is a is a body that's been put together by uh, the state the state government, and a lot of encouragement to think about the role of international education. So as vice chancellors, we find ourselves drawn into that debate. Uh, as the minister said this morning, this is now seen as an $18 billion service export industry. And here we have various criteria that allow post-degree work experience for international students who've done their, their degrees here. And you contrast that with the United Kingdom, which a few years ago would have looked very similar to the Australian dot points. And you can see uh, there um, a very strong uh, export service industry, in my words, being uh, willfully thrown away. And I was in London the other week, and actually my eye was caught by, by this editorial in the Times, students out. Uh, I come from an era where students out most probably meant uh, something different. So there's, uh, there's, uh, there's um, you know, an editorial um, a simple and fair way to bring down net migration uh, numbers would be to exclude foreign students who should not be counted as economic migrants. So the, the, the fight that's going on between the, the Home Office and uh, the uh, other portfolios in, in London over how mobility is seen and how student movements are seen having a very profound effect on the, on the settings. And I'm sure other economies could tell similar stories, but there's, there's I think, a really sharp, sharp counterpoint uh, worth thinking about. On, on the issues that relate to uh, mobility trends, I think, I think this is uh, uh, a really interesting slide. So this is, this is the 
top source of countries for incoming semester type programs. So these are students coming into, into Australia. And uh, I think there's several things that you can see uh, on, on this slide that um, we're still a destination for young American students to come uh, to Australia, both on exchanges and on study abroad uh, pr uh, programs. Uh, you can see the rise of Brazil now sitting in second place, and this is specifically as a result of the Science Without Borders initiative which the Brazilian government has put in place to encourage, e encourage mobility, uh, and then a whole range uh, of engagements and a lot of traditional engagements um, with Europe and, and North America uh, coming through through that slide. So I think I think it is uh, I important as as you as you look at that. Um, if you if you look at um, what the leading destinations are for uh, U.S. Uh, students, you can see the bulk of U.S. students as they leave. Uh, their country to go on, on programs. The bulk of them are going to the United Kingdom. And then there's a whole range of sort of cultural exchanges, if I can uh, put it like that, where clearly uh, students involved in humanities, art, social sciences, going to, uh, to, 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 to Europe. So something like 60.3% um, of um, US study abroad programs uh, now are uh, for summer programs or, of eight weeks or less, which accounts for the, uh, the Northern European uh, uh, engagement that you can see on that slide. So uh, a lot of students moving away from the exchange, semester long or whole year exchange into these very short experiences and the rise, uh, the rise of that uh, emerging. Uh, similarly, uh, when you look at the uh, Australian data, so these are Australian, Australian students uh, going uh, overseas. Now, something like 70% uh, of, uh, of all Australian students on a mobility experience are experiencing a short course or an internship or a research attachment. So the, the, the decline relatively of the long exchange into these much shorter uh, bite-sized experiences of different sorts. Um, I think, I think the, these data are interesting um, from our experience. So I think several things that well, you, you can't see on this slide, but there's, there's a very sharp growth in these numbers. And so uh, they're growing at something like uh, five, uh, five percent uh, per annum since 2007. Um, these Australian data, I think there are seven Asian destination uh, countries in, in the top 18 uh, that are listed, listed there. So these are listing destinations with 500 student exchanges or more. Um, of the American data I showed you, the US, I think there's only, only three Asian countries that appear there. So very different types of engagements that you can see that have been sort of strategically d driven by uh, different types of, uh, of views. Um, so for the uh, semester programs, I think 50% uh, are European, a third of them are North America, so they're still dominating. Um, and then on the short programs, 50% of them uh, are, are Asian uh, destinations. So if I, um, if I jump through to uh, what does that mean at institutional level, and for obvious reasons I've picked uh, the University of Wollongong as, a, as an exemplar of, uh, of an Australian uh, institution. For those of you who uh, don't know Wollongong, that's, uh, that's the Pacific Ocean and the, the, the beach. You're more than welcome as international visitors uh, to come and see it because it's a very fine uh, location. But I think what you'll see in this institution, and I suspect in many other Australian universities is that mobility is now deeply embedded in institutional strategic plans. So almost impossible not to pick up a university strategic plan at the highest level and not, and not see some reference to concepts and ideas of, of mobility. Um, what we've done uh, at Wollongong is to move it away from a central command and control program and to give the role of managing and organising these processes to associate deans international who are uh, attached in each of our faculties. So every faculty at Wollongong has an associate dean uh, international who's an academic, who's working. You can see the very rapid growth uh, of short overseas uh, programs uh, at Wollongong, I think, uh, just to give you an example. Um, 
roughly the semester and short programs were in 50-50 balance until last year and now it's two-thirds, one-thirds uh, in, in, in favour of short programs. So that's with real growth because what we're doing is actually maintaining uh, the, the level of exchange relationships and like every university in this room, uh, I suspect as a Vice-Chancellor, I've signed more MOUs with universities than I can remember, but specific, specifically to drive exchange programs uh, where we've found partner universities with interesting laboratories that we'd like our students to go into and, and vice versa. So they're maintained, the growth is in uh, student, uh, students going on uh, short programs. And then interestingly, um, in the last year, we've launched uh, UOWX, which is um, uh, a formative learning process well, as opposed to a summative process. So trying to record the activities of students involved in societies and sports and politics, etc. And these sorts of exchange programs uh, have become possible to record as activities within that sort of formative framework to be associated with the transcript of a student's degree. And they're recognizing things like global cross-cultural and international opportunities, community opportunities. I, I think we've just heard the, you know, the community session in the previous, uh, previous room. Um, uh, records about employability and internships, uh, evidence of leadership, evidence of creativity, and everything, evidence of, uh, of mentoring. So those are the main frameworks that sit within UOWX, and many of these mobility activities then uh, sit into there. Um, what are the global opportunities uh, that I can, and, and issues that I can still see needing to, uh, to, be, to be thought through? I think the first of these are, are the link into uh, university uh, budget. So inward exchange, and in particular the transnational education processes, which I've, which I've not touched on, are, are obviously major drivers of incomes to many, to many universities. And because of the cross-subsidisation that's permitted from uh, from privately funded uh, teaching in many economies, actually those resources, I think, are holding up uh, many of the uh, STEM subjects that sit within our institutions. And, you know, given the earlier sessions that we had today, and I think, Phil, you know, you made the point, the importance of citations and some of those big sciences that drive that, you know, there is, there is an explicit link here between how do people move around the world and what's the consequence at institutional funding level. I've not tried to unpack that, but I think that's a really big issue uh, for the future that we should try to understand. I started with the, the, the issue about public attitudes and, and migration policy. I think that's still a big issue in some parts of the world and certainly in the United Kingdom is a very hot button. And the, the final point I'd make is that we do know that, that uh, middle class demand will not go away. World student numbers double in the next 20 years. Most of those people will be in the Eastern Hemisphere. So even though all of us will lose market share, uh, in absolute numbers, the numbers will still grow up for the next two decades. So on public attitudes to migration, this is an extract of a letter that went from the UK Foreign Secretary Phil Hammond to the, uh, to the Prime Minister. Um, you can read that. But it, it is reflecting the nature of the debate in the United Kingdom around what's a student and what's a migrant and how do we actually make sure that those issues are uncoupled because at the moment the processes in the UK are conflating what's a student movement and what's a migratory movement. So this, this is a desperately important issue, I think, for all of our economies to understand given the scale of diasporas that, uh, that move around uh, the world. Um, but clearly here, a very profound signal from uh, from the Foreign Secretary to the Prime Minister expressing uh, a view uh, of the impact that's having on the UK economy. And the final point I wanted to make is that, this, is that many institutions uh, like, like mine are thinking very carefully around where, where global presence uh, needs to be. I think we heard from Nicholas just before lunch around you know, their new global campus in, in, in California and trying to get people to come towards them. Here's an example of a different strategy. Uh, Wollongong has been in Dubai for 22 years with a major campus there. Interestingly, that's a, a private institution wholly owned by a public body. Um, 
So that's a private, a private university, it's not a branch campus. Um, in the last year we've just taken over uh, a, a community college in Hong Kong that was part of City University in, in Hong Kong that has 6,000 students and we have major investments in Kuala Lumpur and, and Singapore. So you get, a, you get a sense that different universities have got very different strategies in this space around, around mobility. Uh, by my calculation, there are about 20 universities in the world that now have more international students overseas than they have in their home country. I think 13 are from the United Kingdom and seven are from Australia. So that's a distinctive space that those two economies have moved into and it says something uh, around the long-term uh, imp importance of how uh, mobility. I think the next phase for universities that have done this and that have got international footprints offshore is to say how do we secure additionality by having the possibility, say, for a Wollongong student to spend some of their time in Hong Kong and some of their time in Dubai and have a truly international experience. We've not elaborated that yet. I can see that coming over the horizon strategically in the next, in the next few years. But this area, I suspect, is still got a long way to run. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to pass directly uh, to David to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, David Harrington. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Um, I thought I'd start by just introducing you to, to my company, uh, if you're not aware, Hobsons. Hobsons, we are a, a, a global education services business um, specialising in student success and institution effectiveness. Um, and part of um, our work is involved in, in student recruitment, and part of that work is international student recruitment. And the focus of what I'm going to speak about um, is largely going to focus on a survey that we carried out in March of this year um, with 45,000 um, prospective international students. And we're trying to, to understand um, the decision-making process that international students are going through. And I'm very conscious uh, that the, uh, the name of this, uh, th this session is Student Mobility. Well, the, um, the fact that came out uh, is something that, that, that any of you are involved in international student group will know. Um, is that when international students choose their course, they start first with subject, then with country, and finally with institution. But the thing that came out loud and clear in this survey was that when you look at the non-negotiables in their mind, they're getting fewer and fewer. So those students that in the past were definitely going to come to Australia or the UK are increasingly becoming mobile, global purchases of education. And even when it comes to subject, we're being told by students that they are prepared to change their subject if the offering by the institution can meet their needs. Now, if you dig a little deeper and try and find out what are the, the two things that they value highest, they come out, again, this isn't surprising, but, but I'll go on further. The two things that they identify are graduate outcomes and teaching quality. And again, I'm going to go, we went further and we tried to understand what do you mean by graduate outcomes and teaching quality. Well, graduate outcomes very clearly in their mind means um, demonstrable proof of employability salary, expectations, and transferable skills. And this has been um, something that we've been aware of for many years. And one of the, the, the things that I've noticed, I was involved in, in graduate recruitment for a number of years, both here and in the UK, and, 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 and mostly in, in, in international student recruitment, is that we work with international offices. And most of the universities, particularly here in, in Australia, have international offices of 50 people strong. Yet the last time that I did a count, and apologies if I'm, I'm slightly out here, the number of careers advisors that are 100% dedicated to finding international students' jobs is probably five or less across the whole of the Australian market. So we've got a sort of a mismatch here between the way in which an international student values the outcome, their purchase, and where the institutions are putting their emphasis. Um, 
So um, looking at, at, at um, graduate outcomes, and looking here currently in Australia. In Australia currently, we have a huge um, uh, uh, advantage over our competition with the, um, the postgraduate study, uh, post-study work rights that we currently have. Looking at the US, it's really unlikely that the US is ever likely to develop um, a very wide scale um, pro um, product. And looking at the, uh, the UK currently, um, the political climate in the UK, I would say, and, and I don't know whether Paul, who knows that market better than I, it doesn't look as if um, the UK is going to become very international student friendly for the next three or four years. So I think that what we have is an amazing opportunity here in Australia, not just simply to exploit the advantage that we have, but to build genuine links between the education of international students and employability and proof of employability both back in the country where they came from within Australia and globally out there in um, the world of work. The second thing, um, teaching quality. What do international students actually mean by teaching quality? And, and funny enough, it isn't actually the teaching they receive. Teaching quality came out quite clearly as two things, the prestige of the institution and the price. So they're two things that are slightly harder in which to influence. So rankings, and Phil I can see in the front row there, extremely important in their perception of teaching quality. Price, it was a simple fact of the more expensive the course, the better the course. Although when you do um, um, look further into the data, um, it really is about uh, the institution understanding its brand value and basically making sure that the price of the course doesn't go beyond the brand value of the institution. And we've been doing some work recently on brand value uh, of institutions here in Australia and in fact we've got some research uh, that will be able to be downloaded free of charge from our website. Uh, next week on that. Um, so we've got graduate outcomes and, and teaching quality as the two most important things that are influencing an increasingly um, mobile um, international um, student uh, workforce. What else is it that is important? Well, after that, it then comes down to the fact that this is a, a, a commercial mobile purchasing audience, I think $18 billion, uh, Paul mentioned before. And then it comes down to the simple facts of customer service. There is a direct correlation between the efficiency of services and feedback through inquiries, through application to offer turnarounds, and acceptance rates. The role of the agent is changing. The role of the agent is coming out less as an influencer now, of the student's decision and more of an administrator. So the world of going out and just keeping agents happy is no longer an effective process of actually controlling the number of students that are going to choose your institution. They really are there to fill in forms and to help with visas now. It's going to come down to getting your message right and getting your internal processes right and making sure that your institution and your offering is in line with what the students are looking for. Um, and suppose in, in, in conclusion, I'd say uh, on international student mobility, um, it's an extremely um, mobile uh, audience and every uh, indicator that we have is it will become more and more mobile as every year passes by. Thank you for having me here and I'd like to thank my my fellow panelists, uh, you know, the comments that Paul and David have made, uh, they exactly segue into some of the comments uh, that, that I will make. You know, I agree with Paul. When it comes to international student mobility, we are actually at the beginning of a megatrend, not at the end. To give you some, a sense of it, it took us 1,200 years to get to 100 million seats, but because of how the world's economy is, translate, is transferring into a service economy, the next 10 years means we have to double that seat capacity. To give you a sense of what that means, 
that is again taking $10,000 a seat, excluding land, that is a $1 trillion capital commitment. It'll be one of the largest infrastructure build-outs the planet has ever seen. And there's enough to go around for everybody. And, and so, to, so again, to, to Paul's point, you know, you may be losing share, but this is a market which has a lot of wind uh, in your sails. It's going to be hard to go very wrong if you know how to pull this off. And you know, to, to David's point, we agree completely with Hobson's. In fact, we've worked with Hobson's in the past to do their surveys or work with them to do the survey. Um, international students are becoming more sophisticated. That first wave, well, the first wave, you could argue, were just the super elite of a country that have been going abroad since the 50s or the 1930s. The second wave, which is your mass volume that we see today, that's there. And there's a tried and tested formula for getting them. Monash has made it into a science. A number of other universities have multi-hundred million dollar businesses effectively doing this. But the students have become more sophisticated. What are they looking for? We agree, job outcomes. And, when, and teaching quality, again, just to, as a proxy for prestige. Um, but what, what I would like to bring to the conversation is actually something uh, that may seem not as fundamental, which is some tips and tricks. So in other words, wave one is done. If you're not in wave one right now, you'll need to invest very heavily as a university to figure out how to get international students because the universities that know how to do it today are doing it really well. The good news is the market is growing, so you will probably succeed. But as a wave two university, or a university that is in a geography that has not traditionally competed to get international students. An example of this could be Japan, where we will hear some more comments in the future, or just you know, right after me. Um, what are some tips and tricks for a market that is getting more sophisticated? What are some innovations? And so I'll talk about some of these, but we think, first off, you can expand your addressable market, and we'll talk to you about some ideas there. We think you can expand your target geographies. In fact, uh, Paul mentioned Brazil, and we're going to come back to that as well. We agree with that. That's on point. And you can enhance your acquisition channels, including using resources like the World University Rankings. There's a plug for Phil, my, my buddy. And we'll come back to that. We won't be able to touch on all these ideas because we just don't have time, but I'll tick to them quickly. The first is something as simple as English. So what you're looking at over here is the enrollment in higher education pathways uh, in the United States. And you can see that the largest pathway provider in the United States has cracked into that market, a notoriously difficult market for the big pathway providers. Again, the obvious candidates being Navitas into CEG uh, and uh, study group. The winner in the US market is someone who's done something really fundamental, which has said, why don't I expand my addressable market, which is students who can afford the US, but just traditionally haven't had the English qualification. So you can see of their 1,800 pathway students in the United States, they enroll almost half of them in just in an English pre-pathway. So you know, improving access by providing better ELT support may seem something so startlingly obvious, but if it was so obvious, why aren't more people doing it? And in fact, if we look at that same pathway provider, they have negotiated pathways with their partner universities such that their IELTS score has to be notice or can be noticeably lower than that of competitors. So English is so often a, a uh, you know it's so often a barrier for a student that is otherwise technically qualified but they need to brush up you know, their, their I's and their T's. The second idea on expanding your addressable market is what about students that, that have special skills? And so this is actually a survey that we did of several hundred parents of university, of, of university students in emerging markets that are sending their kids abroad. And we asked the parents, you know, does your child excel at some special skills? Now, you know, look, most parents think their kid is a rock star, but that's okay, they're the customer, right? The customer's always right. And 40% of the parents said, yeah, my kid does something exceptionally. Whether it's dominoes or whether it's archery, they said they do something exceptionally. And a whole bunch of them said, actually, so 40% said that. And off that 40%, nearly 80% then said that, actually, I couldn't find a university that had a program that catered to the needs of my child as an international student. And you can see that, you know, were there specialized teachers and trainers? Was there infrastructure? So we're not telling you that you need to build out a world-class badminton facility to get more kids from Malaysia and China. But what we are saying is, why not have a pathway 
that does begin to cater to students that may have an inclination towards music, if you already have a music program. Why not have a foundation program that does cater to students that are athletically inclined? So you don't need to build new facilities, you don't need to hire new staff, you just need to build into your foundation or your pathway, which is already taking international students a couple more hours of, of track, a couple more hours of music, and show that you cater to the needs of the child. The child is an individual and there's some interests that they have that don't go with a block standard foundation program. It won't cost you much more money, but you know, the incremental value of an, incre of an international student is pretty obvious. The second is expanding your, your addressable market. So there are very few developing countries that have managed to become international student hubs. So you know, again, let's take Dubai and Singapore out of the picture for a moment. You know, Malaysia is one of those exceptions. In fact, it probably is the only exception. And Malaysia has done it by actually focusing on countries that have a, a perceived cultural affinity with Malaysia. In this case, you can see half the international students in Malaysia are actually from other majority Muslim countries, whether or not they're technically Islamic, the majority Muslim countries in terms of religious denomination. And so, you know, Malaysia has benefited from this. Now, today they're trying to manage the mix due to political reasons, but it certainly got them started as a viable international student hub. So again, thinking of, um, you know, can you create value-based pathways is the idea over here. And what you're looking at is, this is really interesting, this is a, a school in Sharjah that we've worked with in the United Arab Emirates. And this school went from nothing to being the largest school, private school in Sharjah with 2.2 thousand enrollments in just three years. And what they did is they basically taught a modern British curriculum. So when you walk around the school, it looks like a British prep school today but they do it within an Islamic values framework. So it is a great school, it's forward looking, they're teaching all the right values, but they've got halal meals, they break for prayers, they're just catering to a particular audience with values. Think of it like a, a Catholic school in the UK in the 1950s. And they're, so introducing more products that are catered around values and needs could be interesting. By the way, for the United States, this is a particular opportunity because there are so many faith-based colleges that could cater better to students in Latin America, you know, of the various Christian denominations. And again, nobody is really doing this today. Um, and coming to Latin America, you know, Paul mentioned Brazil as a growth market. You know, so what you're looking at over here is the percent of students in a country who can afford to study abroad and are doing so. So you can see in Malaysia, one out of three kids who can afford to study abroad are doing so. In India, it's about 14%. Again, it's higher than China from a penetration perspective, not an absolute number. Why? It's English language proficiency. Visa rejection rates have actually reduced the penetration. India used to be at 20%. China's at 9%, which again gives you a sense of how much the market can grow, right? Only one in 10 kids in China today who can afford to study abroad are choosing to do so. And the main impediment to them going abroad is English, which comes back to the first point that we just made. And then, but look at Brazil. Brazil has better English proficiency than China, but one third the study abroad penetration. And so, what is it? all these suggestions are, are, stick, are, are sort of knitted together. In other words, how do we unlock Brazil? You've got to market to them, but build a product around their values and their needs and unlock a significant market. And the other point that we want to make is we think that using sources like rankings, like the World University Rankings, is incredibly important. You know, when we look at visitors coming to the, the THE website, we see that the numbers are growing tremendously. But here's something very important and interesting, which is we found in our surveys that international students will usually go to a rankings website even before they touch a study abroad agent. So in other words, they will approach the WUR and they will treat it with more credibility earlier on in their decision process than they would if they went to one of the big study abroad agents. And so again, thinking about how you brand yourself, coming back to the point that David made from Hobson's, you know, how you brand yourself and how you position yourself on the WUR could be incredibly powerful for you. Um, another point, which is again, something that the WUR could consider, is how do we bring pastoral care 
So you can see again, you know, uh, the, from, from the this, this same study, this was a survey of Chinese students, very similar to Hobson's. What are they looking at? They're looking at uh, job prospects, academic ranking, which is effectively your, your teaching prestige point, exactly on, on, on target. Uh, but the third point, which did come out as quite important and much more important than any of the remaining points, is pastoral care. And how do we bring that into your offering? How do we even bring that into the rankings? So this is apparent from you know, a tier two city in China or Korea or from Saudi saying, how will my child be taken care of on the other side of the planet? This is a country I, mean, I may never visit or I haven't visited what is going to happen to them. And so think about how your university provides or communicates the pastoral care you will provide. Please consider how that pastoral care can be customized to the student. So, good in gymnastics, you know, Islamic faith, what do you do? So these are elements for a more sophisticated buyer, uh, some tips and tricks. And you know, here's another one, Babson College. I love this example. Babson College was a college that was financially unviable in the 1980s and today runs a massive surplus. It actually charges fees that are equivalent to the Ivy League. And what they've done is, again, they've carved out a niche in entrepreneurship. The beauty of this niche, by the way, is you don't need to worry about job outcomes because you're saying, well, you should have gone and become an entrepreneur. <laughs> so you solve that problem. <laughs> and they're, they're not ranked in the WUR 400, but what they've done is they've, they've created entrepreneurship rankings where they come out as number one because nobody else focuses on the space. Right? It's great to be the best at what you do, even if no one else does it. So these are just, I wouldn't put any of these points individually to you as a grand strategy, but I would say that there is a theme connecting all these points. The theme being an audience or a customer base that is becoming more sophisticated, that is getting more information over the internet, and saying, well, that could be, how is that an advantage to us, given that sometimes my university is not the best known in my country or my region? Well, I'd say you can make it an advantage by adapting to that customer base, by doing some very small things that in the end are just good for the student, so it's good for your university, and can produce better academic outcomes. Thank you. Welcome to our fourth speaker, Jira. Let me begin by, by, by saying that uh, we, we were taking Phil's uh, feedback uh, quite seriously, uh, not only about, I mean, Keio, but the entire Japanese uh, universities uh, group, um, that uh, the lagging sort of international outlook is hurting the, hurting the Japanese uh, universities' uh, position in the world uh, uh, quite badly. Um, and, and I, I think that that's a fact, and we have to be to to be uh, to be open uh, to to be receptive of, of that. In many ways, we are uh, in being uh, cursed by our past success. Uh, in, in the in the sense that Japan has been a, a country where we could uh, implement um, higher education and higher research in, in the mother tongue, and which which actually helped enormously in modernizing uh, Japan uh, by uh, what I, I usually term as, a, as a democratizing knowledge. That, the, uh, that, that, that the, uh, the gap between the elite class and, and the laymen, sort of people working in the factory floor, uh, has been closed. I mean, it, it's much closer. And that the uh, in, in many indicators, our elementary school system and the, our middle school system is uh, doing uh, very well indeed uh, in, in terms of uh, performance in, in mathematics and that kind of thing. So in terms of penetration of knowledge, uh, society-wide, economy-wide, has been help, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the educational system in the mother tongue have been, uh, I mean, to this day, uh, ha has been a, a, an enormous plus. At the same time, we, we are acutely aware that uh, by isolating our uh, research system from the world, uh, in today's network world, uh, that will mean, uh, that, that, will mean we will, that the progress of knowledge uh, will, will, will be hindered if we continue to be isolated uh, in, in the way that, uh, that we are right now. 
Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the reason why uh, there has been a government uh, initiative. Uh, last year, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Education and Sport uh, and has, has uh, announced uh, uh, Top Global University Project. Uh, we are happy to be part one of the 13 Type A, Type A, a being research oriented uh, university that was selected. There are 23 other uh, more education uh, driven uh, global universities that's been selected uh, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, so, so that's my, my task uh, at, at my own university is to, 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 uh, to really drive uh, several programs that, uh, that to, to really change the situation. At the same time, uh, because of uh, that, there is, that, that there is a firm reason uh, for the way Japanese universities are, are the way it is now, uh, we, we, I, I'm faced with the really uh, the uh, uh, the task of really res uh, you know convincing uh, the, uh, the the people why we are doing this. I think there are about three reasons why uh, universities should uh, should globalize, and uh, I, I guess one is the one that Paul touched upon uh, is uh, is income. Uh, which is real because uh, Japanese, I mean, the, the number of uh, uh, students, uh, at the, I mean, uh, kids at the age 18 have, have declined to, uh, to less than a half in, in, in Japan. We are, we are a rapidly aging society. And, uh, and, and uh, so, 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 so in, increased uh, income or, or securing income from, from international students is one of the uh, strong motives. I'm a, a bit skeptical uh, if uh, it's going to increase the way it, uh, it, it's some more optimistic uh, things uh, people talk about this. Because of uh, Japan's own experience, I happen to belong to a generation of Japanese scholars where if, I wanted, if we wanted to have a, a decent academic career, just, there was no decent PhD programs uh, in Japan uh, in the social science. Uh, and until about the, 80, uh, the mid 80s, and the, clearly the good, uh, the good way to, to, to go about this was to go to, to, go to, a, uh, to an American or European uh, university to get PhD, which I did, uh, and, and returned and became an academic. But uh, since then, uh, we've been making a lot of uh, uh, investments uh, in, in, the, in the PhD program, and today's young people seem to have less reason to, to, to try to go abroad for better education. And I'm sort of, I don't know if this, I, am, I may be completely wrong, but I think the, 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 when, when, for example, Chinese universities continue to make a huge investment in, the, in, in their own university systems and uh, their quality standard is rapidly rising, uh, that the reason for going abroad probably will uh, shrink uh, as it did uh, for, 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 for the Japanese um, young people. Um, second reason, of course, for our selfish each university reason, uh, of course, attracting the best talent uh, is another, uh, another a big reason why we want to, we want to uh, look around the world and try to uh, have uh, best students uh, come to, uh, to, 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 our, to our program. So that, that is, that is clearly a, a, a reason that uh, we, we, we want to internationalize. And the third reason which I use to, uh, to try to convince uh, my, my people is that because today's issues require international, I mean, today's issues are global issues. Uh, take environment, take aging, take security, Take many many other issues that, that we need we need to tackle. These are all are all uh, global issues that require international collaboration, uh, and, uh, and and thus we need uh, people who are able to operate in in a, in a global environment uh, and, and and tackle some of the uh, key issues uh, with our partner uh, partners, whether it be academic or business or uh, government. 
to, 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 to try to uh, resolve uh, issues. Uh, as far as KO goes, we've identified uh, three primary areas where we would like to contribute. Uh, to, to make it simple, we, we call it longevity, security, and creativity. Longevity, I think we can contribute because the life expectancy of Japan is probably the, 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 it's one of the, the longest. It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, as, as, it's as much a problem <laughs> as, uh, it is, uh, it is, it's, it's, as it is a happy news. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, at any rate, uh, tackling, tackling, tackling opportunities of, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the problems of longevity is clearly uh, uh, somewhere we can contribute. We have the largest cohort of uh, 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 data on, uh, uh, on people over 100 years old, uh, probably the largest in the world. Uh, and I mean, I mean, you can't do that uh, until, uh, I mean, it requires many decades <laughs> to, to build that. Uh, also, a, a security. Security can be on various levels, from, from environment to to, to uh, geopolitical security on the secu uh, on the environmental side, uh, we've had a huge task of clear cleaning up uh, industrial pollution that that occurred in that during the 60s, and that's an Asia-wide issue, uh, which 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 we can share. On the geopolitical side, I mean, there, there has been a, a few news about. Uh, Japanese uh, system going right wing and that kind of things. But I'm happy to report to you that, that we've been able to live pe completely peacefully for, uh, for 70 years without uh, shooting a single bullet on, on foreign soil. And that's, that's, that's something we can, we can share. Also, creativity is, uh, I mean, people come, uh, the, the biggest reason why teenagers come to Japan is for, uh, for anime and that kind of things. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and we, we are investing very heavily on uh, converting that into uh, the age of digital, uh, and, uh, we, which is kind of fun. Right? Um, but we are, uh, so, so th there was a talk, Paul, I think, that touched upon this issue, uh, the, the question of whether we are, we are going for the full, like, the full entire uh, degree program or we'll, we'll focus on the exchange uh, kinds of program. Both are important. But I think, as far as the uh, as far as our, our mission is concerned, I think we would like to collaborate uh, with uh, many universities around the world, uh, developing double degree programs or, or, or joint programs, so that we can we can develop uh, uh, people who are compatible in in, in many systems. Um, but of course, uh, each university may have uh, different uh, strategies on, on these points. When we to start talking, uh, and this is my final point, is that of course this, this, uh, it is an, uh, the task is daunting in the sense that that will mean that we need to standardize our curriculum, standardize quality assurance. Uh, a huge issue in Japan, uh, for Japan has been uh, calendar year, which, which was, which we, we for funny reason, we start in April, and uh, uh, but but now uh, we we are trying to modular. We are, we are, uh, many universities, uh, 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 including Ko, is uh, starting to reintroduce uh, quarter system instead of semester system, so we can modularize our calendar, so that uh, it's, it's it becomes easier to uh, to try to create a joint program with. Uh, uh, universities around the world to uh, to, uh, to 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 do interesting things uh, together, and uh, I, I mean Europe has done quite a lot uh, on, on standardizing many of the things. ASEAN has is, is starting to do you know tackle these issues, uh, and we we are we are currently waiting to see if that functions uh, well, but there's a lot in Asia that has to be done. Uh, we, 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 I mean, the, the systems uh, in this region is not uh, very compatible with each other at this point in time. So I think, I think uh, we can, uh, together we can work on, uh, on making these things better. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Thank I can't, can't remember who told me, one of my colleagues, I think in Wollongong, who specializes in, in, in aging, uh, 
I think she made, she made the point to me that the bad news was that living an extra decade meant that we were going to live as a 90-year-old and not as a 30-year-old. So most of our mental models are, you know, that we'd just be great because we'd have 10 more years, but in fact the life state that we, we will be in might be very, very different. So I mean, the answer to that... Yeah, the short answer to that is we want to, to, to extend the productive age. Yeah. Yeah. Like working yeah. until 89. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. Uh, anybody voting to work to 89? <laughs> Can't see that. So we, we've, got, we've got time for some questions. There are, roving, there are roving microphones on either side. I can see a question here in the front. If you could say who you are, and then there's a, a lady at the back and a lady at the front. Yeah. Hi, Professor Wellings. Uh, I'm from Tsinghua University, China. Um, you know, you, you, there's something that, that really interested me when you mentioned that the, the, the ratio of students going short-term study abroad programs um, versus uh, exchange study actually has substantially changed in your university. I just wonder, want to hear more about it and why is it uh, like this? And the, the, the related question is, you mentioned that your university has actually built these uh, study abroad programs uh, as some sort of like part of the strategic plan of the university. And what is the incentive for the university to do this? Because, you know, I, I raise this question because in China, most universities would not choose to do study abroad programs. Um, well, part of the reason is, uh, you know, THE ranking has not taken that into consideration. Um, so I would like to hear more about that. So I, th I think it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon that's happening across, across Australia at, at the moment. And um, we, ch we changed government here uh, uh, in 2013. And the incoming uh, government uh, made the decision to put additional money into uh, encouraging Australian undergraduates to experience uh, predominantly um, Asian uh, countries. So as I said earlier, from Pakistan, uh, through Southeast Asia, Greater China, and then into the Pacific. And so there are a list of countries. Um, and that, that program, the New Colombo Plan, and I'm one of the representatives on the, the, the Australian Government Committee for that, um, has, has both created a small number of scholarships to allow scholars to go for full years to study in China or Indonesia or Japan or m many, many other countries. Um, um, but of course, most students don't have the language competence to do that for a whole year. Most students don't want to do that for a whole year because they're involved in different types of courses. And this, this program, the New Colombo Plan program, has also been permissive to allow study abroad uh, as one of the activities. And so you can see in, in, the, in the data for, uh, for that uh, initiative, universities now coming forward with cohorts of students who may want to go to, uh, to Beijing or to Hong Kong or Suva or all sorts of places that they would go to, uh, usually traveling with an academic colleague. And the driver for that I'll, is, is financial. So the, the, there's, there's actually new additional money, and I'm looking here for the slide that tells me. So the, fun, the funding, uh, this, is, this is at Wollongong, just one university, 2013, we were spending $86,000 on short course study abroad. 2014, went to 638. 2015, 904,000. It's close to a million dollars. So that's, that's new money coming competitively one, and many of the universities, Australian universities, will have similar narratives to tell. And that's what's driving it, because we are then able to subsidize those students, we'll be able to create very interesting programs in partnership with, uh, with our international uh, university partners that we're visiting, uh, so we're tailoring programs. So for students, say, going to China, it may well be uh, a technical course in engineering, but some, some areas of language skills at very fundamental acquisition and some cultural understanding, and that's what's experienced over, say, an eight-week period. Well, we're now starting to see some students then wanting to go back to say, could I do my master's program in Tsinghua? Yeah, that would be a good, pro a good outcome of a short experience of that sort. But it's all, it's, it's all been driven by new money in the system and 
highly incentivised by the federal government to say this is a legitimate thing that we should aspire young Australians to have. It's only available to undergraduates, so that's one frustration. Some postgraduates would like to do it. Um, but it's just a change in policy. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Sarah from Wiley here in Australia. I just want to say thank you. This was so informative, really. Um, I'm wondering, with the growth of dig digital innovations that we've seen with especially top universities, not only in America, but the UK and now here in Australia, of digitally innovating and, and providing you know, full online programs, how each of you sees that affecting and transitioning the future of international student mobility? I think it will fundamentally change uh, the nature of uh, uh, what we do on the international front. I mean, of course, uh, the, the, the delivery mechanism of, of knowledge uh, is, uh, is going to, uh, is going to uh, change uh, and, and globalize uh, uh, very rapidly. At the same time, I, I think, uh, I mean, if you are to ask the question whether we can go without a campus, I mean, I mean no physical space, that's, that's probably no. But uh, I mean, this this is a perfect example. I mean, the design school and, and the creative, uh, you know, studios uh, and that sort of things. I mean, I think I think campus will be a place where uh, students uh, will creatively, you know, spend not just to receive. I mean, this kind of auditorium listening to to to, to lecture one way is probably a thing of a past. But then uh, to 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 be able to spend time together live together, create together, discuss together, uh, and, 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 and we're, we're equipped uh, with a uh, you know, device that, that makes this, this possible, uh, that, that will remain. So I, I, think, I, I think that the, the I mean, I, I think we, the, the, you know, the infrastructure we're going to need, uh, require to, to, to build the university is completely, is gonna be uh, very different from what uh, it used to be. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the learning style is going to be very different uh, from what it, what it is today. Uh, but then, uh, you know, really we, we need to focus on uh, how, how, how we, we, we can add, you know, value uh, both at the global level and at the local level. Uh, did I address your uh, question? I'll try to respond keeping your acquisition of Dell Tech in mind, so we work with Wiley in the United States. We've worked with your Asia Pac team out of Singapore. We're familiar with your company, and so, so a guy, actually a very famous, a very well-known venture investor in the United States, one of the most successful venture investors in the United States, an early investor in Twitter. So he's pretty good with technology. He said, "Look, Aaron, this is actually the third edutech bubble." The first edutech bubble was, remember when CD-ROM started to show up in the back of all the textbooks? <laughs> and then we, as consultants, got asked this question, which was, oh my god, will, will publishing survive? You know, will everyone just use CDs, and is, is the book dead? Well, guess what? The CD-ROM was pasted in the back of the textbook for free, the price of the textbook didn't go up, and nobody used the CD-ROM. Right? Everyone agree with that? <laughs> the second edutech wave was the dot-com bubble, where suddenly it was like, oh my god, you know what? Like, you can see all the content online. Who's going to go to college or school? Well, guess what? Now there's a link in the back of the textbook to all the content online. The textbook doesn't cost any more, and nobody goes to the link. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the third wave. This is your MOOC, adaptive learning, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I think the way to think about this is the CD-ROM did fold into education and how we provided it. The online course materials did fold into education and make it different, more efficient. And today, the MOOC, right, so for those who are not familiar, this is your Coursera, your edX, or whatnot, they will fold into the university and make it more useful. So today, if you're a university and if you need more classroom space, well, you've got to crank out a whole new building. Well, instead of doing that, why not take some of your basic courses, offer them through a Dell Tech or another, you know, another online enabler or provider, and have intro to biology done online? Why not? 
but the campus experience, the student experience, the, the classroom time can be spent in seminars with interaction instead of the one-way lectures. Better real estate utilization, better outcome for student, and yes, opportunity for Wiley. So, you know, that's where we see, um, that's where we see the MOOC playing into the university, that like other innovations, it will fold into the university and help the university become more efficient, more responsive to its students. I do want to make one more comment. Since we are talking about international student mobility, we do not believe that what students are looking for is the American or British or Australian course. What they're looking for is America, Britain, or Australia. What they want is to come here to learn English in this environment, to spend time with Australians and kids from other countries, and eventually, as per the survey that both Hobson's and Parthenon have done, get a job in Australia, and perhaps eventually bring their whole family over using the Family Reunification Act. This is an immigration pathway one way or the other. Someone has to say that. And so, you know, we do think there's a role for MOOCs even in that, because MOOCs can help with preparing international students for before when they come here. So think about English language teaching or ELT support for, for before when they come onshore. And once they're onshore, MOOCs can provide more remedial support to international students that may need it. This could be study skills for the language support, uh, you know, technology connecting them to tutors off hours. So we do think, again, there's a role, but is it that a student is not going to pick up from Dalian and come to Melbourne because they can get the whole course on their laptop? That, that's not going to happen. Um, it looks like uh, Parthen and Hobson are going to agree again, which leaves me less to say. Okay. Uh, we did ask questions on online uh, learning in our survey of international students, and, and as most people will know here, that the full degree entirely online isn't really an international product. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a local product. And, and students are telling us loud and clear that, that they value a fully online degree far, far lower. And I don't think the institutions have got the offering right. I don't think they've got the pricing right yet. And the answer really is in blended learning. And my colleague to my left said it all. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think if, from an institutional perspective, for undergraduates, we'll move more into to blended and use some online uh, for that. Uh, Wollongong is part of Future Learn, so that's the British, the British platform, and I think we've got three products that we're running there, and they're all very deliberative. They're, I think, common infectious diseases. Uh, there's a maritime law. We have a, the National Centre for Maritime Law, so there's a specialist product there, and there's one that's just about to start in, basically, plastic electronics and new and new body parts uh, in using innovative materials. Uh, they're all designed to say. If you like that, you'll love the steak knives. Come and do a master's degree. Uh, so it's to, to try and get pulled through onto, onto master's, onto master's programs. Uh, you've been waiting patiently at the front. There's another question. I'm conscious of the time. So after this, if anybody wants another question, you need to start waving uh, soon to me, I think. Okay. Uh, my name is Lyudmila. I'm from High School of Economics uh, from Russia. Uh, my question is to David. Uh, you've told that uh, decision-making process depend on subject. Could you please name top five or top three subject or program which are the most desirable for international students? Okay. Um, Thank you. That wasn't actually part of this survey, but that information is, is, is freely available uh, through the, certainly for the AEI website or the <coughs> British Council website as well. Uh, it does differ by country, and it does in terms of where the student comes from, and it differs by the destination country as well. Um, but but that really wasn't part of our, our research. But it's it's preliminary. It's all about employment outcomes. So your engineering, business, management, economics, accounting. It's you know there aren't those many art history. Yep. Sadly. So two very quick questions. So I'm getting the wind up. So one at the back, and there's a lady just down here. So. Uh, hello, my name is Sunmi Choi. Uh, I'm from Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea. And I really enjoyed your talk, but I do have one question about the study abroad program. 
or in a way the popularity among students. Because when it comes to international student mobility for the university, I think there are two aspects. One is really you know, making your, your university very attractive to full-time international students is one thing. And the other is exposing your students uh, globally. So I think that I'm referring to the uh, study abroad program. So what I have found that in the recent two or three years is that our students are growing less and less interest, is interested in studying abroad. And when I investigated, it turns out that employability is indeed very important. But what they're finding is that actually is, you know, having this experience of study abroad is not as attractive as having internship for a semester for their employability. And therefore, students choose to, in a way, to spend their precious time and resources in making their self more employable than going study abroad for abroad. And therefore, I'm finding it kind of hard to promote this opportunity among students. And I'm just wondering whether this is only my unique experience, or if it's yours as well, and also as a Hobson and, you know, Parteon, whether you, your data has shown such a trend among other universities as well. It may be that different things play out differently in different cultures. I think, I mean, I've, I have experience in the United Kingdom and some experience here in Australia. And I think, I think the pressures on young undergraduates to pay rent because they're usually living away from home to maintain a part-time job. Many Australian students would have a part-time job. So the study abroad option of going away for a short period of time, most probably in the first place is, is as good as it gets. So the, the previous model of saying go for a whole year or going for a semester is, is actually a very diff difficult proposition now for us to, to sell. And I think it's, it's actually to do with the modern lifestyle of of undergraduates in, in Australia. I'm conscious of the time, and I'm just going to pass to this lady for the last, last question. Hello, I'm Anamika Srivastava. I am from OP Jindal Global University, India. Um, uh, you've, you've, I mean, I, this question is for the entire panel. Uh, you've been talking about these strategies to attract students to to a region or countries, uh, and you've been talking about the standardization, suppose English language should be a part of uh, the education system and so on and so forth. But when I think of uh, emerging economies or South Asian economies, I think uh, there's enough competition when it comes to all these professional courses, English speaking, all that, uh, to attract students to these economies. Don't you think then somewhere they will have to come up with some kind of unique, unique selling points which could involve uh, a niche kind of courses, like you said, uh, but it could be in history or civilization or religion or language. Um, uh, what do you think about this? The entire panel. Sure Thank you. So, the most, the best known internationally now, arguably, but perhaps the best ranked, let me put it that way, the best ranked Indian academic institution is ISB, the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. The comedy of this, of course, is that it's not accredited in India, and for many years, the dean of ISB used to receive an arrest warrant on his birthday every day from the state. It's a very friendly government in India to all things good, isn't it? And, um, and ISB in its, you know, I, I sometimes attend their board meetings. And ISB in, in, a, in a recent board said, look, you know, we have exceeded our expectations in every way. We are the youngest top 20 MBA program in the world. Our GMAT scores are equivalent to top 10. Oh, exceeded, exceeded, exceeded. They failed in two areas. The first area is they don't have enough women and they are working to address that. The second area is international students, where they have just absolutely undershot the mark. They have to give it away for free and then some to get somebody to come. And the answer is really simple. It comes back to what the data has been saying, what the uh, lady from Korea has just said, employability. Which is, if I have a dollar to spend and I can buy an MBA program for the same price in Singapore, even if it's poorly ranked, even if it's a part-time MBA in Singapore, I can reliably get a job at a salary two to three times that of an ISB graduate in India, but it's much harder to get into ISB, and you know, do I really want to work in India? What, what, why would I do that as somebody who's not Indian? So that is the fundamental challenge to moving students into India. You could then say, well, what about the Indian diaspora? And the most successful example of that is Manipal at its campus in Karnataka, specifically for medical students. 
And so, you know, in that case, it is a niche course, but it's that particular course has almost a unique allure. You know, to become a doctor, it's so hard to get into a reasonable medical program anywhere in the world. And Manipal has special exemptions for NRIs, so Indians abroad to come back and take that program. So, in other words, it's, it's niche and it's patchy, but as Jindal gets going, you know, I wouldn't necessarily place a lot of eggs in the international student basket. I'd focus on the home market, which is still growing and very healthy. That's a great, a great point to, uh, for us to, to, to finish, because I know that uh, Ed Burns getting wound up next door, and we're, we're, we, he's, uh, he's ready to, to go for those of you who are going to go through there. I think that's been a bit of a tour of the houses, so we've covered some aspects of exchange, some aspects of study abroad, some aspects of transnational, looked at policy, market branding, and audience. I want you to thank uh, Jiro, Karan, and, and David, because that's been a really great session. Thank you very much.